Welcome back to another instalment of New Zealand's Bird of the Week, where in this video I will be talking about the orange fronted parakeet, quiet birds that are New Zealand's rarest parakeet species being declared extinct twice before being rediscovered both times. I hope you enjoy. Orange fronted parakeets, otherwise known as Malherbes parakeets in the rest of the world, are small, green, long tailed parakeets endemic to New Zealand that, as mentioned in the introduction, are now incredibly rare. They also have a bluish tint to their plumage, with an azure blue on the outer primaries and primary covers. Their crown is lemon yellow, and the frontal band above the eyes being orange, their most defining trait for identification being about 20cm in length and 30 through 52 grams in weight. Males and females, while looking very similar if you don't know what to look for, do have differences, as males are on average larger, with them also being more brightly coloured, as well as their bills also being significantly longer. Their taxonomy in general has also been quite modelled for quite some time in regards to their classification, as it was unknown if they were their own species or just a colour morph of the similar yellow-crowned parakeets. They were first described in 1857 from a museum specimen of an unknown origin, with the species name honouring the French ornithologist Alfred Malherbe, and ever since, debate ensued. During the late 1800s, many considered them to be distinct species, with even Walter Buller considering them a distinct genus, Plasicircus alpinus, the alpine parakeet. This genus name and name in general didn't stick, and they were later considered a colour morph of the already established yellow crowned parakeets, and as recently as 1990, the Ornithological Society of New Zealand listed them as a form of this species. Later on, when the birds are rediscovered for the second time, which will be discussed later, their DNA was mapped out and analysed, which revealed that they were indeed considerably different and distinct, with the study also finding that differences were greater than those between the yellow and red crown parakeets, which were already long accepted as distinct. Orange fronted parakeets were actually found to be closest to the red crowned and Antipodes Island parakeets. It does indeed seem that there were two streams of parakeet invasions, one from the south and one from the north, orange fronted birds being a part of the southern. It is indeed evident that the genus they belong to, being Cyanoramphus, likely dispersed through a common ancestor from New Caledonia to New Zealand via Norfolk Islands 500,000 years ago. There are features that do distinguish them aside from genetics with yellow crown birds, as they do have subtle distinctions in colour. Walter Buller described the plumage of the orange fronted birds as being a cold blue colour, and in comparison, the lime green plumage of the yellow crown birds is almost goldy. Orange fronted birds have a pale lemon yellow crown and orange forehead band and orange rump spots, while the yellow crown birds have a bright golden yellow crown with a crimson frontal band and rump spots. Although often heard in the forest, the birds can be hard to spot, with the chassicles of the two being similar, although orange fronted birds have proven to be much quieter, making them difficult to observe and locate, with it not being uncommon to be walking through the bush and to find a pair of them staring down at a person at head height, totally silent and only a few metres away which will be relevant later for their conservation. Their diet is one mostly comprised of beech seeds, as well as flowers and buds, being key benefactors of mast years which occur in their preferred environments, being beech forests, in which with more food, birds are then able to breed more and produce more offspring with the sudden influxes of food. As well as feeding on these established food items, they also appear to prefer and consume invertebrates more than any other parakeet species in New Zealand, and while feeding in the canopy, will also forage in low vegetation and on the ground when needed, which explains why they are often observed with insectivorous birds, such as yellowheads, forming flocks of other mixed species when feeding. This has led to the idea that the three mainland species once occupied discrete niches when they were more common, and their environments more intact, with red crowns preferring the forest floor and lower canopy, yellow crowns in the high canopy, and orange fronts being more generalised mid-canopy understory feeders. This is further backed up by the effects introduced predators have had on these different birds, as red crown birds on the mainland decreased dramatically first, now stabilising due to them being more inclined to ground feeding. Orange fronted birds being the next decline, and yellow crowns being more out of the way, are still regionally common in the areas where they survive. Birds can breed in all months, although their main nesting period is between December and April when food is more plentiful during these warmer months. They primarily nest in natural hollows or cavities of mature beech trees, preferring red beech, with their clutch sizes generally being 7, although a range through 1 to 10 is often expected. Their egg laying is asynchronous, with an interval of 2 days between eggs. Said incubation takes 21 to 26 days, and the nestling period lasts 35 to 45 days. 
Females appear to choose the nest sites and undertake all preparation, incubation and bruising, with the males providing most of the food. However, females regularly leave the nest to feed briefly with the male. It is suspected that only the female feeds the nestlings for the first 10 to 14 days, as with other Cyanoramphus species, and after this period, both adults take part in feeding their offspring. Multiple clutches are also not uncommon, and if their first attempt is unsuccessful, then pairs are likely to nest again once a suitable hollow is found, with some pairs breeding 3 to 4 times in succession when food is plentiful. Unfortunately, these birds have had a history of extensive pressure through human arrival and with them, voracious mammalian predators. Subfossil remains indicate that they were still abundant throughout the North and South Islands as far back as 20,000 years ago, and were still fairly common in areas where they were left, especially in South Canterbury. Along with their red-crowned and yellow-crowned relatives, they were recorded in large numbers across the Canterbury Plains during the late 1800s, with these large congregations likely being the result of their prolonged breeding seasons driven by high beach seeding. Birds were then shot en masse due to their feeding on domestic fruit orchards, with many using their feathers for pillow filling. Later on, as more forests were cleared in these areas, and as they were routinely shot, their numbers noticeably fell as noted by the public and ornithologists alike. And because of their extensive habitat modification in the area, it meant that their travels to the lowlands were impeded, and as such, their present habitats may be insufficient to allow numbers to return to former levels. In 1919, Otago naturalist Alfred Philpotts was the main cause for threat to form for the species, with him declaring that since they were now seldom seen or heard in the small forest, they, being never so abundant as the other two, was in all probability extinct. However, they were indeed surviving in more remote areas of New Zealand where they could still survive, and a sighting was made in the Deurville Valley near Nelson, although after that, the species suffered the further indignity of being declared extinct again. Thankfully, in 1980, they were found once again, this time concealed with a population no less in North Canterbury's Hope Valley, and were later found in others as well. Although, as we'll find out, their habit of evading extinction and human eyes is likely to be at an end, as they are now approaching a third extinction, and this time, after extensive scouring in other valleys for hidden strongholds by rangers which turned up nothing, there now isn't a secret population waiting in the winds, and now all hope resides on those that still survive. On the mainland, they are now known only to linger in just four beach valleys, being the Howden, Andrews and Poulter in Arthur's Pass National Park, as well as in the south branch of the Huronui in Lake Sumner Forest Park. Birds are especially vulnerable to rats and stoats, which after being introduced, could easily corner incubating birds rearing chicks in their cavity nests, leading to other problems that will be further explored down the line. The mass seeding events, which before these predators' arrival, which once proved a bounty to them, as it now also culminates with a surge in the populations of rats, which gorge on the abundance of foods, and then also for the stoats that feed on them. After this food supply runs out, however, the then starving rats that remain and stoats then take to other food sources, in this key example being the parakeets and their eggs. This was most evident in 2001 and in later years, where after just a few months in the summer of that year, 85% of a monitored population was wiped out, leading to increased concern over their survival. This has led to further concerns over inbreeding depression and a male biased overall population, as during the early stages of incubation, females are the most likely to be targeted and killed, and will therefore leave a large population of males, but with no females to breed with. A similar situation that has and currently is affecting Kakapo. A study assessing this issue and its extent was difficult to assess accurately when it was conducted, given their considerable area of habitation. Data of the sex ratios of adult birds was collected over a six year period from 2007 through 2012, with the study indeed finding a bias, with there being a typical male proportion of 55 to 66%, and that has been further accelerated by increasing predation. It was also observed that male yellow crown parakeets, occasionally and aggressively so, caught female birds and being larger, I mean 51 grams than orange fronted birds, at a maximum of 52, which could be another example of a male bias affecting both species and the amount of mates available. To combat these threats to their population, there have been many conservation efforts taken to slow decline and rebuild populations and their genetic integrity through a variety of ways. One way was in the form of translocation to four islands, being Meld, Blumine, Chalky and Tohua, all predator-free islands where they have been shown to do well. On the mainland, all known populations are monitored closely, and it was noted that numbers may very well have declined to perhaps 50, before massive intervention to trap predators and to establish a captive breeding program ensued. 
Said captive breeding program was started in 2003, with eggs occasionally being taken from the wild and said foster birds then being able to raise their own offspring, which helps with concerns about genetic diversity. The group responsible being known as the Isaac Conservation and Wildlife Trust. The trust, along with other groups, has reared some 400 birds for release either into the Canterbury Valleys or for islands translocation, although with their continuing decline, the amount of wild eggs being brought in as dwindles and getting eggs from those in captivity, while successful, may limit their gene pool further. Thankfully though, it has been found that when it comes to this issue, birds can breed rather quickly, and on an optimised diet, some pairs can produce six clutches in a year, and some females have laid up to ten eggs in a clutch, with all of them being viable. So their position breeding-wise compared to Karkapo, another bird species with a similar population and position, is quite a bit more optimistic. It has also been found that while yellow crown birds have been observed harassing females, field observations rarely, if ever, reveal mixed pairings, suggesting the two bird species can sustain separate gene pools and may very well have different mates with recognition behaviours. To further assist in their survival, metal tree wraps are also placed around known parakeet roosting and nesting areas, being quite the successful program, with only one nest out of 153 being lost to predators since 2003. To best accustom captive birds to wild conditions, birds are kept in a transitional aviary in the forest for a few days, accompanies with their accustomed and natural diets, allowing them to more easily transition. As before this was done, some birds starved before they could properly learn the ways of surviving in the wild. Birds have been noted by those raising them as completely different to yellow and red crown birds in their behaviour, as well as their preferences. Birds are notoriously accident-prone, doing the silliest things that includes chewing holes in logs, then getting their heads stuck in them and dying, others getting caught up in foliage by their legs, and one that put their heads behind a door as it was closing and got their head crushed, although the latter is more than likely just an unfamiliarity with how doors work. Maintaining low predator numbers is key in their survival, and the extent of this is even more so than other tree nesting birds, as until recently the pest control regime was based upon what Yellowheads needed, which was having rats and stoats down to a tracking rate of below 5%, although it now seems that parakeets need an even lower residual pest population, maybe as low as 1%. With their limited range, population declines, and high level of management, their class is critically endangered. This was made most evident with said masting events, which for example, prior to 2000, their population was estimated in the hundreds, then fell to 500 through 700, and then down through 100 through 200 by 2004, with their population now being stable and increasing, and their current population is likely to be fewer than 100 on the mainland, and perhaps 200 through 300 on islands, highlighting the vulnerability. And with that, I thank you for watching this instalment of New Zealand Bird of the Week. For next time, you are now able to vote for the Buller's Shearwater, medium to large sized seabirds with the long hooked bills that are common around much of New Zealand. With that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.